God created work, and obviously work is important. But so often, those who don't know God don't include Him in this vital area of our lives. And that is also the case even for some who do. Before coming to Christ, my work was focused on success and financial gain, as is the case with many people. But after Christ came into my life by God's grace, everything changed. Buddy Childress and I go back a long way, back to Little League days, actually. We were, went to the same college together, partied together, and we worked together at New England Life. And, but I re remember something different about Buddy. There was a contentment one day, and I just couldn't put my finger on it. He just walked into my office and said, Bob, I just want you to know I've been called to seminary. So I said, naturally, who called you? And at that point, he said, Jesus Christ. And I thought, oh my goodness. You know, usually people go to seminary to become pastors. And to me, that didn't seem to fit exactly with Buddy's um, gifts that he had been given. It was the second semester of our first year. And for about two weeks in my quiet time, that still small voice consistently was leading me to realized that he was calling us to minister the kind of person I used to be. One day he came home and he said, I've, I feel like I know what we're called to do, to use God's gifts that he had given him in the business world in his ministry. So the next day I went to Dr. Wilson, my advisor, who was also the chair of the Department of Missions and Evangelism. And I told him, I think God's leading us to go home. He looked at me and he said, well, buddy, wouldn't it be just like God to use your past for His future? Done deal. God really began to do something new in Richmond because there wasn't a marketplace ministry here or most anywhere else for that matter. And that was 40 years ago. The thing that intrigues me about the luncheons is that they're mainly business and professional people that are speaking, so I could relate to them. I felt like I wasn't being preached at necessarily, and I felt like that these are people just that were just being authentic and sharing their lives, and this was intriguing to me, and it made me feel comfortable about bringing others to the luncheon. When I was a 29-year-old young professional, Bob Fitch invited me to a Needle's Eye lunch, and there I heard a businessman share about his relationships at work and his relationships at home, and he also talked about his relationship with Jesus Christ. I had never heard anything like that before, and I was intrigued, and I was starving to hear about God's love for me. And through their sharing their stories and scriptures that had meant something to them, uh, God used their stories to help me begin to realize that God was giving me my own story and my own calling into meaningful work. 1987, I had a, uh, an experience. I was up in Danbury Federal Correctional Institute. Now, prior to that, I was a hellion. I was totally... I, 
uh, I'd say I enjoyed prison, but I was fine there. I had met Buddy Childress at a Needle's Eye luncheon. Once I got to prison, um, I wrote him a couple letters. Um, he wrote me a couple letters. So uh, when I got out, I started going to Needle's Eye to learn about the gift I'd been given. And I just thank Jesus for, for him changing my life and giving me the opportunity to be here today. Because had he not done what he did almost 25 years ago now, I could not have any kind of a life that make, made any sense. What happened essentially was that Buddy was doing too much counseling and was not able to do a lot of evangelism as he felt called to do in the business community. I was counseling probably 50% of the time and that increased a bit. And so after about three years we decided to form the Christian Counseling and Training Center. Fay Rivers uh, was absolutely uh, a mainstay in the beginning years of that. We had waiting list for the counseling and as it developed we um, began training couples and other people to do some of the counseling and so it was over a long process of years. As people started committing their life to Christ we started asking what are we going to do with these people who are committing that? What's something significant? And out of that came crossover. Cullen and myself we kind of merged. So Edgar Fisher and Buddy and I loaded a pickup truck with uh, exam tables and chairs and that we had borrowed from different people that and we took that took it down to the Word of Life Church and every other Saturday for about a year we saw people in that location. Many of our patients have immigrated from all over the world often leaving war-torn areas of the world and end up in, in Richmond. This family from Bhutan came in and uh, there was mom and dad and four kids. But I was speaking with them and asking them and then the translator was there and I said, so where are these folks from? And he said, oh, they just came in from um, a refugee camp in Asia. They've been in a refugee camp for 25 years. This is their first experience and the UN moved them to Richmond, Virginia and the first stop was Crossover Clinic. I couldn't shake this idea that God was calling us needles out to do something bold. But what I do remember was that God just began to solidify in my thinking that we needed to do outdoor preaching. But you don't do this to business people. And I reminded God of that. I mean, Lord, you don't, you just don't share the gospel if, and you don't do evangelism with business people outdoors on Ninth and Main or on the Capitol grounds. God would not relent. So finally I went to the board and I told them, I think this is what God wants us to do. And they thought I had lost my mind. You don't evangelize business people that way. God says, let me take care of that. Let me take care of that. So in 1984, we got a permit on the state capitol grounds. We knew that downtown in the summer, you're gonna have several hundred people on that beautiful lawn with bag lunches, just enjoying the day. I made the mistake of doing both weeks, first year, just, just myself. Stupid. From then on, I got pastors to preach Monday through Thursday, and I did the last day of the week. Preaching in the open air like that was something I have never done. All of these people had gathered, out, mostly out of curiosity, I think. But I remember being struck with how many people were there when I thought there would only be a tiny subset. And I walked away from that experience thinking this was not just worthwhile, but was very purposeful in the plan of God. From the seven years that I worked there, I saw relationships form and continue over that period that were just amazing. I was most blown away and most impacted by the teachings that Jennifer Parham did. 
Probably seven or eight years into being the director of women's ministry, I began to realize we needed to do something more. And we began to teach women something called inductive Bible study so that they could actually study scripture on their own without being spoon-fed scripture by someone else. A lot of impactful, meaningful things happened when I was on staff here with Needle's Eye. As you know, there's always new initiatives and new things going on. Um, one of my best memories was of a retreat that we did. Janice Berker was our speaker, and she's so real. And Janice just modeled such humility and such honesty and a great deal of humor um, that I think it allowed everybody just to lay down their defenses and, and to just be open to the goodness of God and to the transformation that happens in community. Hundreds of women were touched by the ministry of the women in the women's ministry, small group leaders and and friends who sat around tables and loved on and wept with and laughed with. And that's a rare thing to be entrusted with the sacred space in people's lives. Buddy informed me that there were about three other guys that were starting their journey. And he suggested that maybe we get together to start this first small group. And uh, he suggested we meet at the office at 7 o'clock in the morning for six weeks. I know I said, and it turned out all of us said, we, we just didn't think we could fit it into our schedule. And then he asked us if we wanted to go for another six weeks. And, and uh, we said, sure, we'll go for another six weeks, thinking that that would probably do it. <laughs> The Bible study back in the 80s, late 80s, um, where we study Galatians, I've learned so much and I still have my notes written in the Bible that I use, my study Bible, from the 89 Bible study. For 30 odd years it was the priority for our week rather than trying to fit it in. Um, it's been very meaningful to me and, and hopefully I've given a little bit, a little bit back. As we began to see more and more people come to faith through the luncheons, we really began to start to focus more even on discipleship opportunities. And through that process and process of prayer, small groups started. Week, I, I do joke about the fact how just a half dozen guys would get together for uh, 20 or 30 minutes at Centenary United Methodist, and Buddy would have a great teaching, and then we'd all sing a particular hymn off key, and then go back to our, our work. We, I saw just such a level of love and acceptance in those groups. I saw leaders pouring out and serving one another. And as a result of that small group community, people found their way to Jesus and it became real. He became real. And as a result of that, they wanted more. Several of the members of small group came in to me and said, I really want to have an opportunity to be in a group with other people and from those guys along with a few people from outside of Richmond whom I knew uh, we began what's today still called the Christian Presidents Groups. These guys have been a blessing to me over this time because they share with me their thoughts about what I should be doing in certain situations and we're very honest what stays in the, what we talk about in the room stays in the room and uh, I listen to what they say and if I'm smart, I follow their opinion, because sometimes I haven't, and I've regretted it later. So they're very good, and it's been a blessing to have them. And they will call me, and I will call them, and we'll pray together for a few minutes, just out of the blue. And it was really an exciting experience to take uh, members of the business community of Richmond into places uh, where they probably would not have ventured otherwise. 
And my hope, and Buddy's as well, was that it would be life-changing for people who went. And it really was. I went to uh, Haiti probably back in the early 90s for the first time I saw true poverty. And what it did for me was make me more generous when I came back. I realized that the financial means that God had given me was not that uh, important for me to live with everything I wanted or everything I desired. It was a more of a heart to be more generous. One day I was so sick. And I remember lying down on, on a little wooden pew. The pastor's wife, um, just a little Mayan woman who didn't speak any English, came in, sat next to me, put her hand on my head, and began to pray for me. All of a sudden, I just broke into a deep sweat and then uh, sat up and was 100%. An absolutely uh, a phenomenal miracle in my life. And Jeff, uh, to this day, every time I see him, he says, Oh, I remember what happened in that little church in Belize. And it was so authentic what happened to you, uh, I won't doubt again. And more bad economic news tonight. The Labor Department said today that 39,000 people lost their jobs. In the various recessions that we've had over the years, Needle's Eyes found that there are many uh, businesses who've really struggled. So the, uh, the board decided to put together a, a team, and the idea was that if there were businesses in the community that were struggling, uh, Needle's Eye would have one of the team leaders go and discuss the issues of that particular company and then try to put together a team that could perhaps give them some good advice. The opportunity to even take out of our busy lives time to administer and minister to other people uh, is extremely satisfying. It's often difficult to uh, bridge the gap, if you will, between my business and professional work and my spiritual life. And this, one of the brilliant things about um, what this program offered was an opportunity to meet some needs in the kingdom and help build the kingdom and help a few people out in difficult circumstances. CTG uh, probably impacted me more than it did those who participated. I was able to uh, focus uh, not only on their issues but also uh, use my experience in the business environment. Uh, I endured five takeovers and as a result of that, was able to use a very difficult time in my life to reach out to those people. It was sort of a payback. I mean, I got so much out of it spiritually and so much help from Jim Hunter, who led it, that I just felt like God said, okay, uh, now I want you to do something to help others. I remember uh, one woman. She had been a very successful businesswoman, owned her own real estate business. However, after the Great Recession, she really lost everything. She lost her business. When she joined CTG, the members just really uh, walked beside her, uh, encouraging her, sharing their faith stories. She just blossomed. And today she's employed full time uh, back in the real estate business. I think one of the more impactful galas that uh, I attended was the last one, which was Tony Bennett. Um, what an inspiring talk, of course, his five principles um, that he has very firm belief in and how he explained them and used biblical principles to share that with the audience was just amazing. I was felt really um, particularly good about that one because I had invited uh, my nephew and his wife and niece and her husband and several of the friends to join me and I felt like that his message was very well received and certainly had an impact as far as their lives. They, they thanked me profusely afterwards. And of course if you really listen and you really try to embrace what he had to say you can't help but impact your own life going forward too. Needle's Eye sponsored a seminar called Concerts of Prayer. And Needle's Eye, what Needle's Eye proposed was, as I recall, a day-long seminar for people who are interested in intercession. 
And at the end of it, I think that Buddy said, are there people here who would like to continue this, not just stop here, but maybe get together regularly to pray for the city? And I think about 40 people did. And at one point, as an example, we got together on Saturday, having prayed for people in authority, that God would raise up, that he would tear down, that he would bring to light what needed to be brought to light. One Saturday when we prayed, we realized that the former mayor of Richmond and the, the Commonwealth's attorney were both in jail. The mayor for corruption and the Commonwealth's attorney for um, punching out one of his adversaries, I believe, or contempt of court. That was it, because the city was a mess. I mean, the city, you know, the city, Richmond, it is astonishing to me. I, it makes me cry when I think of how different Richmond is now from when I arrived in 19, I arrived in this fall of 1978. And so here we were, black and white, different, you know, economic, social status. But they're coming together where the ground at the foot of the cross is level, really as God's children. And I, I believe that he built some, something for his kingdom during that time. So the idea of culture sensitization uh, sort of grew to radio. You know, I'm, I'm really glad we could break away for a nice quiet dinner together, honey. Mm -hmm. So many couples we know are just, well, they're growing apart. And boy, I sure don't want to see us. Excuse me, honey. Sure. Yeah. What do you mean it won't work? Yeah. Oh, no, no. Just reconfigure it to option B. Yeah, and then get back to me. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. It's okay. Maybe more marriages would last if more husbands and wives weren't also married to their jobs. A man named Moses said that marriage is the most important and precious of all human relationships and the most sacred. This message from Needles Eye Ministries. In 2005, I went through a divorce. It's amazing how much a divorce is like a hand grenade going off. It just totally disrupted my family, my children, uh, my business, and I was not in a great place. And it was a lot of disappointment that I felt and a lot of anger. <clears throat> And I had a friend of mine, Randy Wyckoff, who came to me and said, hey, for the last year I've been going to this, this ministry called Needle's Eye, and it really seemed to have helped. Uh, Buddy and I had a great conversation. He asked me a lot of questions. And at the end, he just very calmly looked at me and said, uh, if you didn't have all these things going on in your life right now that were not going your way and going wrong and that you couldn't control, um, would you be sitting here with me today? And I said, no. And he looked at me and he said, does God have your attention now? And that's pretty much where I came to Christ. The, the change in me uh, has really affected, especially my three daughters, um, because they could see growing up, I coached all their teams. I was, um, I was where I needed to be, but I was too caught up in worldly things. Um, I was chasing the title. And just through that whole, especially 2005, when, when 2004, five, when the divorce was going on, uh, they hated me. I mean, I'll just be honest with you, they absolutely hated me. And then at the end of that year, we sat down and I just went through with them all the mistakes I had made and how I was working very hard to change my life and to give my life to Christ. And it was a great, we went through that for about two and a half hours and all of us cried. And, um, you know, since then it's been, it's great. Uh, it took some rebuilding, but I couldn't have done it without Christ. In the early years, Spiritual Shots actually addressed more current events questions. But about four or five years in, we realized that a nerve that needed to be tapped into uh, in the community was these difficult questions, apologetics-based questions, like, if God is good, why is there evil and suffering? And the tagline that we developed over the years was open, honest, spiritual, in a bar. I remember walking in that first night and there were about 150 people crammed into that upstairs bar at uh, Bottoms of Pizza, and I, I was terrified. I mean, I just remember my heart thumping and my throat clenching. I mean, how am I gonna talk in this public space about God and suffering and Jesus in the middle of a bar, and there's everybody's drinking, and I needed a drink. And <laughs> I remember once, there were a group of um, biologists who started coming who were strident atheists and they would bring their Sam Harris books and 
uh, ready to defend atheism. And actually one of the guys I ended up becoming friends with and we started a little group together with some other people who, who were Christians just reading some books together to discuss um, philosophy and the Christian faith. I think only Needle's Eye could have developed this kind of ministry that was transcendent across churches and across different groups of people that we could gather that were really on the cutting edge of, of sort of the sacred secular divide. When I was in my last year of my private practice, dental practice, um, I decided it was time to retire and made the decision to do that. Uh, somewhere maybe a month or so out, uh, I became aware of the fact that I was going to have a lot of time on my hands. I think my wife probably had a, even a, a bigger awareness of that. So three of us got together uh, with Buddy Four. And we met and talked about our concerns and where we were in life and the needs we had and the future and God's will. The meaningfulness in life, it doesn't end at 50 or 60 or 70. God wants to continue to use us throughout our lives. And the second half in all those 150 or so guys really proved that. There is a need for older men to have a fellowship opportunity like, like second half. That became, we became very aware of that. Uh, we started with three men. Uh, we now have over 200 that have been through and involved uh, with second half. Uh, we, we've got a paraplegic that we spend time weekly uh, uh, stretching and uh, massaging. Uh, there's just many, many things that we've been able to do. The, the, the biggest need, I think, if I had one word to say what would be the most significant part of the second half to me would be relationship. Uh, and so the relationship has been great. Uh, uh, this has not been a service group organization, but it's amazing the amount of service that God has generated through our men. Lisa and I, we both shared our great affection for young professionals for various reasons. Lisa was a mom, I was a foster parent, and we met one day and we sat down and on a piece of paper, we developed an eight-week course. They so appreciated the opportunity to come every week and meet with their peers that they said, we'd like to continue meeting. Lisa on the cuff said, we'll meet at my house. and. That Thursday, or several Thursdays after that, we started meeting at Lisa's house on Thursday while continuing the YP class. The momentum that the Lord had for these young people to come into the fullness of who, who He created them to be was just miraculous. When I was at the first meeting um, as a representative of the board and just seeing what it was like and it was funny because there were only five people there and the group leader said, you know, don't worry if there's nobody here, you know, we're going to stay with it, God has something for us. When I walked in I thought, oh, maybe we'll be like eight people and then I walk in and I was like, oh my goodness, there are like 50 to 40, 40 to 50 people like <laughs> packed in Lisa Ratner's living room, like people must really like this place. It's given me somebody to rely on on a consistent basis, um, having like-minded peers that want to follow the Lord. When life is difficult and hard, it's, it's very comforting and empowering to have brothers and sisters in Christ around you to encourage you and point you to truth when you need to hear it and to give you fresh insights on the Word of God. I felt that there was a need for people that were what I call in the prime of their career, rather than being young in their career. We just felt that 
the Prime Professionals community can move from a position of identity in career and faith to a position of influence. To influence our coworkers for the gospel, to mentor young professionals, to potentially be mentored by those that are, that are older, that are looking towards retirement, and just have a place for connection and community for those that are, uh, that are in their 30s and 40s in the prime of their career. The gospel to me is Jesus showing compassionate love to his followers and to everyone that he died on the cross for. And the way I see that today is in my relationships in the community through Needle's Eye and how we encourage one another and remind each other of what Jesus came for. It was the most meaningful ministry I have ever been involved in in my life. For men and women to come together, find the common ground of Jesus, and let that ignite them to service, to loving one another, and to building these lifelong relationships. I mean, I just, that makes me, yay God. <laughs> <laughs>